Okay, um, so this time I'm going to talk about uh, recurrent neural networks. Uh, but before I do, um, last time we actually had a, uh, um, we ran out of time to talk about convolutional models for sentence pairs. Um, so I would like to talk about this uh, briefly uh, before we get into recurrent neural networks. Um, I think this is uh, important and useful. So um, let us talk about this. So um, the basic idea of convolutional model of like models for sentence pairs is um, there's lots of uh, tasks basically that want us to reason over um, pairs of sentences or pairs of texts. Um, and some examples of this include uh, paraphrase, paraphrase identification or sentence similarity. So given two sentences, uh, we want to determine whether they're paraphrases of each other or not. Um, whether they mean the same thing. Another example is textual entailment. Textual entailment is basically saying whether um, the information in one sentence is entailed by the information in, a, in another sentence. So um, an example of this would be uh, Graham taught a lecture on recurrent neural networks today entails Graham taught a lecture today. You know, it's, um, uh, the, the second is true if the first is true. Um, and there's also contradiction, which is uh, saying Graham did not teach a lecture today uh, entails that Graham taught a lecture on recurrent neural networks today is false, basically. Um, another thing is retrieval. So, um, for example, if you have uh, if you have a big database of sentences or responses or something like that, um, you might want to retrieve the best one and return it. Uh, one example of this that I use every day is uh, the Google auto response on Gmail, uh, where <laughs> Somebody says, uh, "I'd like to have a I'd like to have a mo meeting at uh, tomorrow. Would seven o'clock or nine o'clock be better?" And uh, you reply with, "Sure," you know, because <laughs> that that's what it suggested to you. Um, uh, but you know, re retrieval basically replies, uh, you know, tries to retrieve uh, from a f finite set of you know possibilities as opposed to like generation models, which we'll talk about later. Um, but anyway, convolutional networks, one application of them is uh, for modeling these sentence pairs. And um, a very early example of this is, uh, is something called Siamese networks. Basically what this does is it uses the same network to um, extract a single vector representing two uh, sentences, or in this case, two, um, two handwritten <laughs> signatures, and try to find the nearest neighbor. Uh, according to the representation, or if the representations are close to each other, then you say it, it's a paraphrase. If they're not close to each other, you say it's not a paraphrase, for example. Um, so this is really simple. You just have a, uh, a single convolutional network. You, um, you extract the uh, convolutional or any other kind of network. You extract a single vector, and you, um, uh, you calculate a distance measure over them. Um, then uh, there's also other more complicated uh, methods for using convolutional networks for this, which are maybe a little bit more interesting. Um, one example of this is uh, the convolutional matching model. And basically what it does here is it combines uh, sentences into a 3D tensor and performs convolution over these sentences. Where, for example, the um, uh, each of the... Um, you have sentence S, and you have sentence uh, you have sentence SX, and you have sentence SY, and basically each um, each point in this uh, kind of matrix here is the concatenation of the features from sentence X and sentence Y. So what this means is, um, for example, the the very top left. Uh, row one, column one, would be um, would be the vectors from the first word in sentence X and the first word in sentence Y. Row two, column one, would be the second word in sentence X. Uh, sorry, would be the sentence word in set, sentence Y and the first word in sentence X, um, etc. And basically, you stack these vectors together, and then you do a two D convolution um, or three D convolution. Uh, you do a two D convolution over them. Uh, so what this says basically is you're sweeping 
maybe a three by three, um, uh, a three by three matrix over all pairs of sentences, uh, all pairs of words in the two sentences. And this allows you to extract features of kind of like consecutive regions in both of the sentences. So what would this allow you to do? This would allow you to, for example, come up with the fact that um, uh, don't like, which is two words, right? Um, is very similar to dislike, which is a single word. Um, and this three, um, this window of three, uh, three by three would basically serve as a feature detector that would allow you to detect, you know, these kind of uh, paraphrases or, or whatever else. So um, then after you do this, um, you do, you know, more convolution, more pooling, and um, as a result, uh, extract uh, essentially features that you can use to do things like uh, paraphrase identification or other things like this. So this is an example of when you would use 2D convolution in, uh, in an NLP task. Uh, and then um, another method which basically uh, this, I don't know if it's still state of the art, but it's very close to state of the art for uh, things like, uh, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you make the uh, the, the two, oh so if the sentence lengths are not equal um, that's perfectly fine um, basically what you do is you have a matrix that is not the same number of uh, rows and columns so the rows are the length of sentence uh, sy and the columns are the length of sentence sx um, and one of the nice things about convolution with pooling is that after you do pooling. Um, you can uh, basically uh, reduce a variably length matrix into a, a single vector. Um, or you could use something like dynamic pooling, where dynamic pooling takes the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter, which would take a variably length matrix and reduce it to a, like a four by four matrix, where you could then do you know, more pooling or something like that. So, um, yeah. Um, so the first 1D convolution yeah, I'm trying to remember the details of this. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't I don't remember the details of this. I think that that's the a less important part, and I think maybe they ran a one D convolution before they're constructing this or something like this. Or they ran a one D convolution afterwards. So in our yeah. each unit of the first attack matrix, there's mm -hmm. a tag the of the two words in that end. Yeah. So they somehow get towards the second matrix. I was mm -hmm. wondering how it how it's the process. Um well so ba basically like my my understanding of this, although I'm getting a little bit nervous looking at the uh, <laughs> looking at the picture here, I might be thinking about the next one that I'm introducing. But um my understanding is basically what you do is um you have a you have a matrix where the top, uh, this is the length of SY, and this is the length of SX, and then the depth so the third dimension of the tensor is essentially equal to the, the size of the features of X plus the size of the features of Y because you're concatenating, um, you're concatenating the feature vectors for each word based on the, the, uh, the rows and columns. Um, and then the way you process this is basically you have a convolutional filter, where if you remember from the last class, a convolutional filter is basically the width. So you have the window size over x is the first dimension. The window size over y is the second dimension. The, um, the feature, size of the features plus the size of the features is the third dimension. And then the fourth dimension is an arbitrarily large uh, length. I know it's hard, but my first thing is where is the locality here? What's here? Oh, so the locality here is because these windows are like win window size three. So basically on the, on the um, sentence X and sentence Y, you'll be looking at consecutive um, 
essentially consecutive windows of three words. Um, but it'll be, for example, uh, here is an example. Uh, okay, so and like this is like a topic of the and example. So you'll be looking at like this on both sides. So it's more of a physical evolution. Because the window is 2D. Yeah, the window is 2D. Yeah. So you, when you have a 3D tensor because the number of features is also included in the size of the tensor, but it is a 2D convolution. Yeah. Well, so it, the reason why I said this is nervous, I was getting nervous, was because I was looking at this and I thought maybe there's a pre processing step that I forgot when I read this paper you know, two or three years ago. But, um, I think maybe they maybe they are running a 1D convolution first and then running the 2D convolution after that or something, but um, I'd have to go back and read the paper carefully to check. Um, so um, th this is an example uh, that takes this even a step further. And basically what they do is they, um, they start out with a very low, um, uh, you know, like, Something similar to what I talked about before, um, but then they uh, they add other things like um, averaging, uh, dynamic k-max pooling. Like uh, you know, I talked about dynamic pooling and k-max pooling. This is basically the combination of the two. Uh, they do more pool, uh, convolution, more averaging, more k-max pooling, and the idea is basically you want to go from um, very short uh, representations that look essentially like a bag of words. To things that capture local features, like you know, three uh, three word sequences, like what I talked about before, and then all the way up to the top where you're capturing features of the whole sentence using like kind of stacked uh, stacked convolutions, and then in the very end, uh, they basically take the features from each of these levels, concatenate them together, and use this as the representation of the sentence to make some decision about like paraphrasing or um, uh, or something like this. So this is actually quite complicated. It's a, a quite a complicated method, but they got, uh, I think it makes sense, and they got pretty good results for this. So if you're looking at modeling things like pairs of sentences for you know, paraphrasing, uh, entailment, sentence retrieval, uh, that kind of thing, I think this would be a good paper to take a look at, I guess. So, um, so yeah, that, that's what I had from the last class. Are there? Any other things? Sorry, this is a little bit vague, and my memory is a little bit vague from <laughs> reading it. But um, it, these are some references that you can look at. OK. So I will move uh, back to the RNN, RNN stuff, uh, which is what we're actually supposed to be doing for today. Um, I realize uh, my slides are a bit, um, a, a fair amount of this is actually covered in the Goldberg book. So I'll go through them quickly and see if there are any questions. And then if there aren't, I'll cover some uh, recent interesting things that, uh, that have come out recently about uh, RNNs and kind of like interpreting them and making connections to other models that we know about. So um, the... So RNNs, um, it, it also said so in the Goldberg uh, book as well. But these are kind of a very essential tool in our toolbox. And while people have um, been you know, thinking of alternatives to RNNs and, uh, and different formulations of RNNs and stuff, I think there's still something that almost everybody will use at some point in your like, neural networks for NLP career. So, I think it's worth uh, understanding them and understanding them uh, well, understanding the inside of LSTMs and, and GRUs and stuff. So I think the, the uh, book uh, explanation was, was good. So um, for NLP, uh, one of the things we want to handle is uh, sequential data. And um, sequential data has, for example, words and sentences is the most obvious form. 
We also have uh, characters in words or sentences uh, in a discourse, um, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, we have lots and lots of examples of in NLP where you know we have smaller parts in a sequence and we want to compose them into, into larger parts. And there's also long distance dependencies in language, um, agreement in number, uh, gender, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, he, for example, if you have he does not have very much confidence in himself uh, versus she does not have very much confidence in herself, um, you can see that you would remember he from a long time ago and she uh, from a long time ago and uh, try to figure out like which word you would pick next. So I had a question on Piazza that I just remembered now that I think is a very good, uh, very good question, um, which is, why would a CNN not be quite as good for modeling something like this? So does anybody, um, does anybody have an idea why this would be a little bit harder to model with something like a CNN? Or a dia uh, specifically a dilated CNN? Any ideas? Because when you want to match the first word and the last word, the default feature is not very fine way. It's very the, the, uh, because when you're um, when you're attempting to match the first word and the last word, the features are not very fine grained. I think that's that's a pretty good explanation. Um, I, let me try to make it a little bit more concrete, but I think that's basically correct. So. If you think about what a dilated CNN is doing, basically it's um, when you predict the next word, you have um, at the very bottom, you have a bunch of convolutions that maybe combine two words together. And then you have a bunch of convolutions that combine four words together. And you have a bunch of convolutions that combine you know, eight words together um, to get your final one at the top uh, to combine 16 words. So if you want a 16 word context, you would need to do this. Um, number one. What if you needed a 30 word, 32 word context, or you needed a 17 word context in order to remember he, because it appeared you know, very far uh, at the beginning of the sentence, you simply would not have that context in a dilated CNN that was only 16 words long. Uh, so that, that is completely impossible. Now even if it is within, uh, even if it is within the context, um, each of these individual filters basically needs to decide is it on the left side? If it, uh, I have a he on the left side, or if I have a he on the right side, then I will need to remember this because this might be useful later. Um, so that's the case for this up here. It's the case for this down here. It's the case for this down here um, for both uh, the left side and the right side. So if you have a limited amount of training data, maybe your, you know, your training data has seen he on the left side of one of these filters, but it's never seen it on the right side of one of these filters. So you would never be able to learn this. Um, and you know, he is maybe a common word, but maybe it's a less common word uh, that, that you need to handle. So um, in contrast to this, RNNs have the ability to basically activate a node somewhere in the RNN, and then just remember that node forever, as long as that node is useful. Um, and it doesn't depend on being on the left side or the right side. Um, and it just seems like uh, kind of a, a more natural way to do things. <coughs> to make it um, even more, um, okay, so he, here's, here's another one. Um, but to make it even more complicated, let's say we had something in the middle. Um, so for example, let's say we had, um, this is not a very good example, but like, the boy, the boy who, who read the book, the, the boy who read the book that the author wrote really liked it or something like this. So what you have the boy and then you have the author, right? And which is the most salient piece of information when you're trying to decide liked at the end of the sentence? And basically, 
in language, we have this hierarchical structure of language where we can pop things on a stack, uh, pull things off of a stack, uh, or push things on a stack, pop things off of a stack, and kind of have salient pieces of information. Um, RNNs can do something like this. They can, you know, theoretically they can do something like this. But for things like CNNs, you start needing to remember information like, I've seen the subject of a verb over here, and I've not yet seen the subject of a verb over here. And you need to combine the features together in an appropriate way to do this. And my, my intuition is that it just seems like it's a lot more natural to do this with something like RNNs uh, that kind of have this uh, sequence by sequence, uh, like uh, word by word computational capacity. So um, I don't know, this is kind of maybe a little bit vague. Uh, there's, there's better explanations of this. Um, like, for example, there was a paper in uh, ACL last year um, by uh, Kunkoro um, uh, et al. Uh, who's uh, Adi Kunkoro. He was actually a MLT student here before moving to Cambridge in DeepMind. But um, Oxford in DeepMind. I shouldn't get that wrong. Uh, the, the British people will get mad at me. Um, <laughs> but the... Uh, the um, they did things like showing how you know LSTMs can do a pretty good job of these things, uh, but you know models that explicitly take into account the structure of the sentence can do better. But anyway, so uh, I feel like there's a lot of things that RNNs can uh, like this uh, can handle better than uh, than CNNs in this case. Um, are there any questions about this before I, I move on? No. Okay. Um, so. These cases of agreement or whatever can be complicated. Um, so, for example, um, the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was big. Um, so, what what does it mean here? Probably trophy, right? Okay. So, um, the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was small. Which one is this? Suitcase. Okay. Um, does anyone know what this uh, what this is? Okay. Um, uh, this is this is co-reference resolution. That was that was good. Does anyone know the name of this particular test? Yeah, win a, Winograd schema. Very good. So this is uh, this is something called a Winograd schema, and basically it's an example of whether a model can understand uh, or whether you can understand semantics. Um, so, like for example, you need to know that when you fit something in something, the thing that you fit in the other thing needs to be, you know, uh, needs to be smaller. Uh, so uh, this is kind of interesting. If you want to take a look, there's also a Winograd schema challenge. And you can see how people are are, are doing on this. Um, so recurrent neural, neural networks, as we're um, as we're talked about before, um, they're basically tools to remember information. Where a recurrent neural network Instead of um, uh, doing, you know, a transform of the input itself, does a transform uh, of the input given the previous transform that you made? So it's any, you know, any model that has this kind of recurrent uh, dependency between the previous and the uh, next input states. Um, and when you process a sequence, though, one of the important things and one of the reasons why it's easy to train recurrent neural networks with standard tools is uh, you can actually um, unroll them in time like this. So when, once they're in, unrolled in time, you can see that there's no cycles in the recurrent neural network. So this is just a feed-forward neural network. It's a very deep feed-forward neural network, um, and it changes in size uh, every time. But it's still a standard uh, neural network, feed-forward neural network with no sequences. So um, you can still represent it as a directed acyclic uh, computation graph, uh, et cetera. So for training RNNs, uh, you use them to make predictions. Uh, you have labels, and you calculate a loss function at each of these particular places. Um, and then you sum together the losses, get your total loss, and um, then you just do uh, backprop over them. So uh, you take the total loss, and the red is the gradient uh, flowing into each of the individual elements. So importantly, uh, the parameters in the recurrent neural network are tied across all of the individual applications of the recurrent neural network. Um, so 
the to uh, make a concrete example of this, uh, the parameters for each of these functions are shared, which means the derivatives are accumulated. So all of the losses that you have flowing into each of these places uh, basically uh, will have some sort of influence on the RNN. Um, so I, I think this might be elementary for some people. It was also written in the, in the book, but were there any questions about this part? Um, so what can RNNs do? RNNs can do uh, lots of different things, and the things that they can do are very similar to the things that CNNs can do. Um, so RNNs can represent the sentence. Uh, they can read a whole sentence and make a prediction. So then you use maybe the last state in the RNN to make a prediction over the whole sentence. Um, they can also represent the context within a sentence. Um, so you read the context up until that point, uh, up until that particular word. Um, so when you represent a sentence, basically you take the last state, as you showed here. You can do that for things like sentence classification. Um, you can also do it for things like condition generation, which is, uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of examples of this in, in the following classes. Um, this can also be used for retrieval. So if you want to um, perform retrieval over, uh, you know, like sentences to, for a chatbot or something like that, you could, uh, um, you could do that as well. And when you represent context, basically you take all of these uh, all of these vectors and you use them to predict labels individually. And this can be done for things like tagging, uh, language modeling, uh, calculating representations for some other downstream task, uh, et cetera. So um, language modeling is like a tagging task uh, where each tag is the next word. So basically what you do is you predict, um, you input S, uh, you predict I, you input I, predict hate, you input hate, predict this, input this, uh, predict movie, input movie, predict uh, end of sentence. Um, so this is very similar to uh, what I talked about um, uh, in the feed forward language modeling part. Um, so in the feed forward language modeling part, if you remember, uh, we were reading in the previous two words and calculating a hidden state and then using that to predict the next word. In this case, we're inputting the previous word and the previous hidden state, uh, using that to connect, uh, calculate the hidden state and predict uh, you know, the next word. So what are the implications of this? What, um, both, bad and, both good and bad. So there, there's one obvious good implication of this, and maybe one slightly less obvious, but maybe perhaps still obvious uh, bad implication. Any, uh, so what, what's the good thing about using something like this instead of a feed-forward network that reads in the previous two words? Yes, exactly. So you have unlimited context. So, for example, I had the example, uh, he does not have very much confidence in himself. This has, you know, very long context. Um, and a recurrent neural network, because you could read in, so he is the very first word, activate a node in this recurrent neural network, and then keep that node activated all the way through to the end until you get uh, himself, uh, that would allow you to, um, to capture this long distance context. So what, what's a bad, what's a less good thing about uh, recurrent neural networks? Yeah. The tag can't depend on things that come after the word. So that is definitely true for this particular thing. Um, in the case of language modeling, um, that's actually a condition for it to be a language model. Um, in order for it to be a language model, you can't contact, you can't condition on the following context. So in the, in the language modeling case, that's okay. Uh, but for something like tagging, that, that definitely is a problem. Uh, are there any other, uh, any other things? It never forgets. It never forgets. The RNN never forgets. I, I like that as like a movie title or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that, that might be true for this for a very simple type of RNN. There are RNNs that can forget things. That, that actually wasn't the answer I was looking for, though. Um, anything else? Sequences might be of different sizes. Sequences might be of different sizes. So, uh, yeah, that is a problem. Why, why in particular would that be a problem? Uh, so you have to do a lot of processing, like padding and masking. Yeah, so you have to do a lot of processing, like padding and masking. I'll get to that later. But um, that's... 
that is kind of a problem. Um, let me uh, let me explain um, w without that. Van vanishing gradients uh, are another problem, but you you have basically gradients that don't propagate at all for feedforward networks. So in contrast to feedforward networks, that's not a problem. But I, I was thinking about a similar thing. Um, one of the problems about with recurrent neural networks is um, they're more complicated in a way. Um, you have sequences of various lengths, so um, you know, you need to have essentially different computation graphs for each sequence. Also, you have these recurrent dependencies on the previous, uh, on the previous thing, which, a lot, which causes things like vanishing gradients, um, which I'll talk about in a second. But also, um, it means that your network is much, uh, much deeper and much more complicated, which makes implementing it efficiently uh, a problem. So I'll talk about each of these uh, in turn, but just keep in mind that these are, are some things that uh, uh, pay attention to. So, yeah. So in, when using RNNs for, say, language modeling or something, mm -hmm. so do sequences of different lengths have different impacts on the training uh, weights, mm -hmm. or are they the same? So that's, that's a good question. So when you're using RNNs for something like language modeling, do sequences of different lengths have different sizes of impact on the training? And the, long story short, the answer is yes, uh, they definitely do. Um, if you remember looking back just a few things over here, um, the loss function, particularly for something like language modeling, will be, um, will be the sum of the loss functions over the uh, over all of the outputs uh, for a particular sentence. So, if a sentence is twice as long, the amount of loss you're calculating um, will be twice as large. Um, that being said, uh, that might be a good thing. You know, you have more words, you should get more feedback from more words. Maybe um, it also uh, might be a bad thing. Maybe it over. You know it fits longer sentences much more than it fits shorter sentences. So um, you, you could uh, ultimately, you know, intuitively, you'd have to think about what kind of impact that would have. Um, are there any other questions? OK. Um, so I will uh, move on to the, uh, the next part. So for. Um, the, the problem of not being able to represent left context, uh, bi-directional RNNs are our standard way of fixing this. So um, instead of having a single RNN, we have two different RNNs. And um, one RNN reads the input from left to right. So that's the one on top here. Um, one, input, one reads the input from right to left, which is the one on bottom here. Um, then we can do some sort of combination between the two. Usually we concatenate the two vectors. And then we use them to make pr uh, predictions. And usually this is for things like sequence labeling. Um, and this is a very, very strong baseline for sequence labeling, um, especially if you use something like LSTMs. And actually, um, there's been lots of work to improve over like by LSTM plus you know, concatenation plus prediction for sequence labeling. And um, in some cases where you have enough training data, the, you know, like the gains you get from doing more complicated things are quite minimal. So, um, th this is a very good thing to have in your uh, toolbox of things to use. Um, so there's two different ways to implement RNNs. Um, the first way to implement RNNs is the simple way. Uh, and it basically um, recursively calls a particular function um, t times, where t is the number of time steps that you have. Um, there's a more complicated way um, that's faster, which is why a lot of people use it. But I think it's worth discussing both of them. So for simple implementation of RNNs, um, basically, um, if you think every RNN is um, every RNN is a uh, th there's two parts that go into it. One is a set of parameters, and those parameters parameterize the function that you calculate. The other is a function that is calculated based on those parameters. So um, in the case of Dynet, and other things are also pretty similar, um, you first define a, um, you define the set of parameters. And in many toolkits, we'll have something like RNN class, LSTM class, GRU class. 
And when you call the constructor of that class, it will define all the parameters for you. You could also create your own class, right? That when you call the constructor of that class, it, um, it defines the parameters for you. The next thing that you'll want to do is you'll want to get an initial state. Um, very often, the initial state of an RNN will be a zero vector. Um, so this will be, you know, all of the, you know, the um, vector is initialized to zero. Um, you'll do this uh, sentence by sentence at the very beginning of the sentence. And then um, you, another function that you will either use or need to implement if you implement your own type of RNN is something that adds an input and gets a new state. So basically what you do is you, you take the state um, and you add an input to it and you get a new state. And then you step through your sentence uh, word by word uh, applying this function. Um, and then you'll also want to do something like get the output of the RNN. Um, and the output of the RNN for a simple uh, RNN, it, uh, like an Elman RNN, is just the, um, the actual hidden state itself. But for things like LSTM, it's, uh, it's more complicated, as you, you read in the reading. So um, I, can, I can skip that. But basically, um, you, what you can do is you can look up all the word embeddings for all of the words in the sentence. And then the most important thing is where you step through the sentence. And um, uh, every time you add a new input, um, and once you add a new input, uh, you can use the output of that input to do something like calculate a softmax and calculate a loss function, et cetera. So basically, um, the implementation I have here is for a language model. Um, and in the case of a language model, um, you are going to uh, input the beginning of sentence token, uh, call the update function to get this purple vector here, and make your prediction uh, calculate your loss based on that. So um, basically, the simple implementation of an RNN, uh, I have a bunch of Dynet specific uh, stuff here, but the basic implementation will be similar in other toolkits, um, is this for loop where you step through the word IDs and the word embeddings and basically um, you know, update and calculate the plus functions here. At the very end, as I said, you sum together all of the losses and return this as your loss function. So this is a simple implementation of RNNs. It's really nice uh, in one way because it's essentially equivalent to the, um, to the things that you would implement, uh, you would read in a paper. You know, you, in your paper, you always define things uh, as recursive functions like this as well. Um, and I have an example, a code example of this, the sentiment RNN here. Um, let's see. Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about the more efficient uh, version of this later, but are, are there any questions about, uh, about this? Yeah. There's a question about RNNs. So we say that the parameters are shared across time. Mm -hmm. So does that cause issues? Because it, it, it seems like all the words are getting equal weightage um, so the parameters are shared across time. Uh, will that cause issues because it seems like every word in a sentence will get equal weight? So this is a very interesting question. Um, it's not unique to RNNs. It's unique to anything where we calculate a loss function over all the words in the sentence. Um, and the answer to this question is it depends on what you care about. Um, it depends on what your evaluation measure is. And this has a very, very long answer. And the very, very long answer I'll be answering later in classes, in like three separate classes where we talk about reinforcement learning or structured prediction or things like this. Um, also a shorter answer is if you, um, if you only care about like word by word accuracy, like let's say we have a part of speech tagging task where our evaluation measure is how many tags did you, did you get correct? Um, this actually isn't a problem, um, or it, theoretically it shouldn't be a problem. And theoretically the reason why it shouldn't be a problem is um, the amount of, uh, essentially you're, you're trying to maximize the probability of the correct answer over all of the words. And your final error rate will be how many words did you get incorrect. So. Uh, this particular way of training the models is equal to maximizing your expected accuracy. And maximi maximization of expected accuracy, or, which is also called minimization of expected risk, is a very 
reasonable method for training uh, for training these models. So it's not a problem in the case where we're independently making predictions over all of the tags, but when the predictions are no longer independent of each other, for example, if we're going to talk about sequence to sequence models later, um, then in that case, uh, yes, we do need to think a little bit more carefully about this. Um, one thing, though, is let's say your evaluation measure for, um, for part of speech tagging wasn't, um, wasn't the accuracy of each tag, but rather the ac um, named entity F measure or something like that. Like how many, uh, how many named entities are you able to recover uh, in, in an um, output? And in that case, um, you, have, you might have very imbalanced classes where you have uh, the named entities are very rare and not a named entity is very common. And in that case, you might want to upweight uh, like the probability of named, uh, the, the weight that you give to the loss over named entities or something like that. So um, uh, yeah, the, there's a much longer answer to this, but I'll, I'll keep it a short answer for now. So, so yeah. uh, how would this work in, for example, language modeling, wherein some mm -hmm. words are very frequent, like A, B, and all that. Won't that contribute more to the training weights? Okay, so that, that's a good question. So what, what, if, um, what if in language modeling you have words like uh, the, um, and you know, very frequent words, wouldn't they contribute more to the learning? Um, the answer is yes, they do, but they also get learned very, very quickly. Um, and because they get learned very, very quickly, um, from the very beginning of training, you actually are able to predict them pretty accurately, so the loss for these words is low. Uh, but the more difficult words, the rarer words, you aren't able to predict them very accurately, so the log probability of these is large, or the negative log probability of these is large. So essentially, I think this is a common, a common thing, which is, where at the beginning of training, you learn the frequent phenomena quickly, you learn the infrequent phenomena you know, less well and closer to the end of training. Um, that being said, one very, very common problem with uh, any predictor whatsoever, not, neural, not necessarily neural networks, any machine learning model, is being biased towards the majority class. So when it doesn't know what to do, it will try to output, um, uh, it will try to output you know, the majority class like uh, or the, and it will be less good at outputting frequent things. And that, I think, is, is not a, it's not a simple problem to solve. Like, you don't want to solve it by doing heuristic weighting of the outputs. Rather, you should think about what is it that I want to optimize? Do I want to optimize my log likelihood, or do I want to optimize my ability to recover infrequent words or something like that? You define a loss function, and then you use the things that we'll talk about in later classes to optimize that loss function appropriately. So, yeah. um, any other any other questions? This is a very good question. It's kind of an aside because it, it's not specific to RNNs. Okay, so I will move on. Um, so, vanishing gradients were also talked about a little bit in the um, in the reading, but basically the vanishing gradient problem is uh, like, for example, let's say you're using an RNN uh, where you want to predict the sentiment value of the sentence uh, based on the inputs. So you run a unidirectional RNN that reads the sentence from left to right. And then at the very end of the sentence, you have a squared error loss over the sentence sentiment value. So if you get the sentiment very wrong, you get a bad loss. Um, so in this case, um, this is fine as a model, but it's difficult to optimize because basically, um, Oops. Um, but it's difficult to optimize because basically we, uh, we have nonlinearities and other things squashing the, the gradients here. So as we, um, as we travel back through the sentence, our gradients from our loss function get lower and lower. So you learn the things at the end of the sentence better than you learn the things at the beginning of the sentence. And LSTMs are uh, one example of how to... Uh, how to fix this. Um, basically, it makes additive connections between time steps. Um, and addition doesn't modify the gradient. So there is no, uh, there is no vanishing. And then, but you have gates to control the information flow so it can learn things. So the core of the LSTM, the really, really most important thing of the LSTM is this additive connection up here between the previous cell state and the next cell state. And this is what ensures that you don't have vanishing gradients because basically, the gradients from this cell here get passed uh, directly back to the cell here and can flow all the way back through the entire sentence. Um, so the LSTM paper actually 
is kind of nice to read if you haven't read it. Um, it's a little bit hard to understand at first, but once you understand it, it's like, you know, this makes a lot of sense. Um, so you, you could take a look at it, but basically LSTMs, uh, th this is the core idea of the LSTMs. And this also gives them a couple other nice properties uh, as well, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Um, so I have examples of LSTMs. This is as simple as replacing RNN with LSTM in the code, so I won't, uh, I won't bother uh, showing that. But um, were there any questions about LSTMs, uh, like in the reading or anything like this? Okay. Um, so one of the really nice properties about LSTMs is their additive, um, their additive gates not only make them better for modeling, things, but they also make them more interpretable. And um, you can actually look at LSTM cells, and the LSTM cells very often seem like they mean something uh, that makes sense to humans. So there's a very nice paper um, by uh, Andre Carpathy on, um, on examining what LSTMs learn. And you can actually pick out individual LSTM cells uh, that look like they express something salient uh, and actually make sense. So one example, uh, this is on a character level language modeling task on either natural language or code. And one example of this is a cell, um, I think red means low and blue means high, a cell that at the very beginning of the, um, at the very beginning of the sentence, it uh, starts to be, um, uh, it starts to be high and then it gradually decreases and decreases until you get to the end of the sentence. And by the time you get to the end of the sentence, this is, uh, this is low. So does any, anyone have an idea about what this cell is controlling in your predictions? The length of the sentence, um, more specifically in predicting the next word. The, the, yeah, full, full stop, uh, so like a period or the end of sentence symbol. Uh, for example. So uh, language models at the end of a sentence, you have to predict the end of the sentence. So, um, so this is one good one. Another interesting one that they found is that there's a cell that turns on inside uh, quotes. And um, basically what this, uh, uh, what this does is when you have a quote, the moment you see the quote symbol, the cell turns on. The moment you see the close quote symbol, the cell turns off. Um, so, you know, the way like let's say you have a book, um, the way things happen in quotes, you might have the third person within a quote, but you'll never have the third person, you, uh, outside of a quote. So you know the, the word choice is very different for these, and by having a single node that controls this, this allows you to do things like this. Um, for code, uh, you see it turns on at the beginning of if statements. You, know, you can find all kinds of uh, interesting things here. Um, one other reason why I like this paper is, um, is that it also showed a negative example. It showed that some of these, you can look at them and you can't tell what they're doing at all, which, you know, uh, which makes sense. Um, but I, I think this is, uh, this is very interesting. Um, so I think this is, uh, this is largely due to the fact that we have purely additive connections. Um, if you just have a, regular feed-forward neural network, um, you can actually kind of rotate the matrices um, arbitrarily. And by even if you arbitrarily rotate the matrices in the neural network, you can calculate exactly the same function. So because of this, individual nodes actually don't, very often don't mean a whole lot. Um, uh, the individual nodes in a neural network tend to not be super interpretable, but the LSTMs, I think, largely due to these additive connections, uh, tend, to be, uh, tend to be quite interpretable like this. Some other interesting examples. Um, LSTMs naturally learn to count the length of sentences. So if you have um, uh, an LSTM encoder-decoder, which reads in a sentence and then outputs another sentence, um, you can find single nodes that basically decrement by one um, every time, or decrement by a fixed amount every time you, uh, you have a particular input, and then increment by a fixed amount every time you, uh, you have a particular output. So then once, uh, once this value goes back up to you know, the value it was around the beginning, uh, you start 
improving the probability of the end of sentence symbols. So um, another example of this, this was a very, uh, very impressive paper uh, or uh, very, very impressive uh, blog anyway. Um, uh, they had very, very beautiful animations. Um, but basically what they did was they trained an LSTM, a big LSTM on lots and lots of uh, data on uh, movie reviews. And then based on that, they were able to pick out a single node that had good correlation with the sentiment of the movie review. Um, and you can see uh, they did the similar thing to the Andre Karpathy paper here, except uh, you can see that when, uh, when it starts to get bad, uh, the, the single node uh, goes down as well. Um, so one, one thing um, also that I, I forgot to add to the slides but might be kind of interesting is uh, there was recently uh, a nice piece of software. Um, whoops. called um, LSTMViz, which allows you to um, visualize the hidden nodes of your, uh, of your LSTM, et cetera. LSTMViz, a visual analysis system for scoring and hypothesis about state dynamics. So, um, the next word is So you can see like which ones go up, which ones go down for particular parts in the sentence, uh, et cetera. So um, I, th I think this would be a, an interesting tool to use if you're interested in analyzing things. Yeah. I think this is the this is the cell state. Um, in the cell state, I th they are looking at each individual component, um, and you could see at the very beginning they had um, they had the same sentence, uh, but with lots and lots of different like copies of the same sentence with different colors. So what that allows you to do is like look at all of the 512 or so uh, hidden nodes and try to pick out one that looks particularly interesting. Um, I understand that this is a difficult thing to do because, you know, we as humans, it's not very easy for us to look at 512 things and like figure out which ones are, are interesting. Um, what we can do instead um, and what these papers did, and I think is a good tool to have, is basically they, they had an idea what they were looking for. They were looking for um, uh, the length of the sentence. So what they did was they trained a classifier, a linear, a linear classifier to try to predict the length of the sentence. And they found which features are most useful in predicting the length of that sentence. So if you do that, then you know you, know you want to know something about the length. You predict the length, you find which node was best, and then you can go in and visualize like just that node and see if that is matching with your intuitions. The only problem with that is you have to know a priori. Um, what you, you're looking for. You have to know that you're looking for length or know that you're looking for sentiment, and that might not be necessarily be the case, in which case you might just want to look at all of them and see if any of them are doing something interesting. So. Um, there's other examples by Xi. Uh, um, here, I, I'm sorry, I forget his first name, but uh, he has another example of this where they predict part of speech tags or um, the tense of the sentence or things like that. So I, I think that's a, a good way to you know, pick out salient things. Um, any other questions about? Okay. Uh, yes. So we did talk about the great inventorship problem. If you say because the LSTM has the addition, so that means so that the gradient can pass through. But actually, uh, the board addition, you have to do this forgetting multiplication and and integration and multiplication. Uh -huh. So that's and the forgetting is is uh, computed by a sigma, which is between zero and one. Right. At least if you have a very long dependency, you see on what we're going to have a gradient become smaller, smaller, and smaller. Okay, very, very good question. So um, because there's the forget gate in the LSTM, and because the forget gate is doing a multiplicative, uh, the sigmoid actually isn't relevant here because the sigmoid isn't applied to the um, to the value of the the cell. Um, the only thing that's applied to the value of the cell is a um, is the result of the sigmoid. And that's a, um, a dimension-wise multiplication. 
But the dimension Shinwise multiplication is something between 0 and 1. And uh, so the gradient will get smaller and smaller and smaller. Actually, um, the original LSTM did not have a forget gate. Um, I don't know if people realize this, but the original LSTM didn't have a forget gate. And the reason why the original LSTM didn't have a forget gate was so they had absolutely no nonlinearities or no modifications to this additive connection. Uh, the forget gate was in a paper that was slightly later called Learning to Forget. Uh, um, and the forget gate is very, very useful because sometimes you do want to forget things. But I think it does potentially damage your ability to handle long-term dependencies. Um, so empirically, it works a lot better, but it might also hobble your ability to do long-term dependencies. One thing that people do uh, is for the forget gate, they set the bias of the forget gate to 1 on initialization. And what this does basically is it sets, at the beginning of training, it sets the forget gate to be close to 1 most of the time. Um, so at the very beginning of training, you don't forget very much. And then as you get farther on to training, you learn you know, how to forget uh, better. So I think um, that's a very good point. But empirically, having a forget gate does, uh, like, does a lot better. And you can think of reasons why it would be useful, like once you've used once you've used information, you might want to get rid of it so you can add more uh, information. It would allow you to learn short-term dependencies better. So um, there's that. You might like you could think of having the forget gate only apply to half of the nodes in the LSTM and see what happens. I don't know that I've never tried it before, but uh, yeah. I'm trying to understand articulation to lines where it's your CN. Sure. So while uh, we are predicting, so we are, we accumulate logs to the entire thing there. Mm -hmm. so Um, we, we actually don't. We take a single back propagation step. I, I will, I'll, I'll talk about this. I'll talk about this now. <laughs> so I, I feel like I could skip this. So generally, uh, we, we take a single back propagation step. We unroll the whole computation graph for the whole sentence. Um, we calculate the losses for each of the words, maybe. Um, if, if we're doing a language modeling objective or we calculate a single loss function at the end, and then we backprop all the way through the graph and update all the parameters. So th this is the, the, normal, the normal way of doing things, and that's exactly what you suggested. Yeah, but were we not like, accumulating all the losses together? So how do we calculate the losses for each of the individual words? Um, well, so if you're making predictions over each individual word, you calculate the log probability of the correct word there. Um, then you add them together, which gives you a single final loss function, and then do back up. Um, so long story short, the easy thing that you suggested is what we actually want to be doing. Um, however, there are cases when we can't do this. Um, one example is due to memory limitations. So if we want to fit everything on GPUs, um, then this is, a, uh, this is a problem. So for example, words in full documents, if you want to model like all of a Wikipedia article that has 10,000 words or something like this. Um, you might not be able to fit it on a GPU, or even if you can fit it on a GPU, you'd have to make your mini batches very, very small, um, which would not be computationally uh, effective. So um, the uh, one thing that you can do is something called truncated backpropagation through time, where basically what you do is you calculate your forward pass like this. Um, and you calculate your loss function for the first sentence. And then instead of keeping the whole computation graph around, you just keep the very last state over here and use this very last state to initialize uh, this sentence here. And um, what this means is you're doing backprop into all of these. Uh, when you calculate like the loss function for this sentence, you do backprop into all of these RNN functions. But because you've already thrown away the computation graph up here for memory purposes, um, you can't do backprop into all of these RNN functions. But still, empirically, this, um, or still, this is a, a reasonably good idea because you can use um, the information uh, from the previous uh, sentence still. Um, you just might not learn how to extract uh, the information well from the previous sentence for the next sentence. So. Um, 
So th this might have gone above and beyond what your question was, but th did that help answer? Okay. So um, because we're starting to run a little bit low on time, these are excellent questions, by the way. I'm happy to answer them, but um, I'll, I'll go on to the um, other stuff. So um, one really important thing in implementing RNNs is to be able to do it efficiently. So um, mini-batching, as I talked about before, makes things much faster, but mini-batching in RNNs is actually uh, harder, uh, significantly harder than feed-forward networks. And the reason why is because each word depends on the previous word. Um, so the seventh word in a, in a sentence will be having a different computation than the sixth word in the sentence, which will have a different computation than the fifth word of the sentence, and it's much, much more efficient to create a single computation graph and, uh, and share all of those computations together. Um, and sequences are, are of various length. So what we do for mini-batching is instead of mini-batching over individual predictions, we mini-batch mini over uh, sentences. And um, in order to handle sentences of different lengths, we have to do something called padding, which is basically where, where we add extra symbols uh, to the end, of the end of the sentence or beginning of the sentence or wherever um, that we will uh, then throw away later. Um, we then uh, you know, run our RNN. Now, um, we can run the RNN on these two sentences because now these two sentences are the same length, so it's the same computation graph. Um, so it's one, two, three, four, five, uh, length five with the addition of padding. Then we calculate the loss. Uh, we're calculating the loss is the same computation for all of these sentences. But then we do something called masking. And what masking basically does is it gets rid of some computations uh, by usually multiplying in one zero masks. And um, so what this does is it says, sure, we did calculate the loss function for this final padding symbol, but then we want to delete it from our computation. Um, so when we delete uh, this from our computation, now we have um, non-zero values for all of these, but we have a zero value for this, which we wouldn't be calculating normally in our, uh, um, in our you know, unbatched computation. Then we take the sum of all of these, and we use this to, um, we use this to calculate. So unfortunately, this is really annoying. Um, like you spend, when you implement models, you spend like half your time doing this. Um, and half your time implementing the actual model if you're doing like more complicated things. Unfortunately, there are, um, there's some support for doing things like this. Um, for example, in, in Dynet, uh, you can use automatic mini-batching. When you use automatic mini-batching, instead of doing batching explicitly yourself and doing padding, um, you create the computation graph just by writing a for loop over all of the sentences. Um, and it will automatically basically do all this uh, combining together of the, of the results here. Um, that being said, this is a bit slower because every time you're expecting your model to you know, batch for you and it, it has some overhead, it might not do it as, as you know, intelligently as you would have done it yourself. So um, there are other uh, things, like for example, in PyTorch, there is the, um, what's, what's it called, packed sequence or compressed sequence or something? Pack sequence. Um, so there's the packed sequence data structure. And the packed sequence data structure basically, once you create things in a sequence and say which things are actual words, which things are padded words, etc., cetera, um, then it will handle a lot of these things for you, although not, not everything. So um, there, are ways, uh, there are ways to do this uh, in, uh, in frameworks that make uh, this stuff easier. So that's a good question. So would this work for the bidirectional uh, RNN? And the answer is it's more difficult, but you still can do it. Um, what you need to do in bidirectional RNNs is you'll note here that when you're running the backwards RNN, in this case, you would be reading in um, one padding symbol uh, first and one um, and then another padding symbol, whereas a, where in the normal bidirectional RNN, you'd only be reading in you know, a single padding symbol. Um, so this is a problem. Uh, essentially, when you're doing mini-batched calculation, your calculation should be exactly the same as if you weren't do, doing mini-batch calculation. So if your backward RNN gets a different result um, when you do batch calculation and when you do unbatch calculation, you'll get different results at training and test time, um, and your decoding won't work, you'll get strange bugs, etc. cetera. Um, so in order to do this for backward RNNs, basically what you need to do is either use 
pack sequence or something like that that has already thought about it for you. Or um, another thing you can do is basically when you run the backward RNN, you can check whether this is a padding symbol or not. And if it's a padding symbol, um, you essentially reset the state to what it was before you ran the RNN update. So you have this, uh, you have this function where it's like, um, if p is 1 if you're padding and 0 if you're not padding, and then you have a function that looks a little bit like this. So um, if you're padding, you use the previous state. Uh, if you're not padding, you use the state that your RNN calculated. It looks a lot like a GRU, coincidentally. But um, uh, th this is basically what you can do for masking in, uh, in RNNs, like backwards RNNs or something. Um, another thing is uh, when you're calculating these things, um, bucketing and sorting uh, outputs. So um, if we use sentences of different lengths, too much padding, uh, sorry, padding and, um, and masking can result in decreased uh, performance. So one example, let's say you have um, a mini batch of 32 sentences and the 32 sentences, um, 31 of them are of length two or three and one of them is of length 100. You end up masking 97 or 98 times for 31 of the sentences in your, in your mini batch and then you only have one sentence where you actually need to do 100 calculations. So um, what you can do is basically you, um, you can sort sentences by length and put sentences of similar length in the same mini batch. And this will allow you to like, minimize the amount of padding and masking that you do and, and maintain, uh, maintain good efficiency, um, even in this case. Um, another problem with, uh, with pad doing padding and masking is memory usage. So um, if you have, uh, it's very, very common to create mini, ba mini batches based on the length of the, sorry, the number of sentences in the mini batch. So you say, I'm using a mini batch size of size 32, where 32 is equal to the number of sentences. The problem is the ma maximum memory usage um, throughout your entire corpus, your entire like training data, is equal to O of N, where N is the mini batch size, times M, where M is the longest sentence in your corpus. So the reason why is, you know, if you have 100 times 32, um, you will, uh, if, if your maximum length is 100, and you have 100 times 32, basically you'll be padding up all the other sentences in the mini batch to be the same size as the maximum. So one solution to this um, is uh, that I use very frequently in my own experiments is um, not creating mini batches by the number of sentences in the mini batch, but rather creating mini batches by the number of words in the mini batch. Which means if you have a really long sentence, the, um, the number of sentences will decrease. But if you have really short sentences in your mini batch, you get more sentences in the mini batch. And also, I think this has an auxiliary nice effect of making the number of loss calculations be identical or very similar across many batches. So the kind of gradient that you get from each many batch is approximately the same scale. So um, this is another thing that you can, you can think about. So like uh, many batching by number of sentences per many batch versus number of words per many batch. Um, so I, I have a code example uh, here as well. So the final thing that I thought I would mention is um, optimized implementations of, uh, of RNNs. So this is the other way of implementing RNNs, um, and it's maybe the more standard way for things like, um, uh, for things like TensorFlow or PyTorch. Um, and basically what you do is um, even in the simple uh, implementation um, of, uh, of these you know, recurrent neural networks, remember we were calling the recurrent function n times, where n times is, n is the number of time steps in the sentence. And um, as I'm going to talk about a little bit later, calling GPUs multiple times is very slow. Um, like just making a single GPU call is slow. So you want to optimize the number, uh, you want to minimize the number of GPU calls you're making, basically. Um, and for some RNN variants, um, for example, the LSTM and the GRU, there's efficient uh, full sequence computations supported by, uh, by a library called QDNN. 
Um, and basically what this does is instead of making a single GPU call for each time step, it fuses all of the, um, all of the GPU calls that you need to calculate for an entire sequence together um, and makes basically a single call. And this can greatly improve your efficiency, um, especially if you're using a, a framework that, uh, that relies on this heavily. Um, so the way you do this is you take all of your inputs and combine them into a single tensor and you do a, uh, a single GPU call um, to QDNN LSTM or uh, QDNN GRU. And usually there's a wrapper around these and things like PyTorch or TensorFlow, for example. Um, the downside to this is this really reduces your flexibility. And what I mean by this is, like, let's say you want to implement your own RNN cell. Um, uh, if you want to implement your own RNN cell, you would have to write your own CUDA code in order to do this. So um, most people in here, including me, uh, don't like writing CUDA code. Um, I can write CUDA code if somebody like holds a gun to me. <laughs> um, I, I definitely don't want to do it. So um, you know, it, the, le the avoidance of having to write CUDA code to implement new types of RNNs or to implement structured RNNs or things like this um, is one major downside to relying on these implementations, even if they are very fast. So, um, yeah, I guess that's all I have for this time. The RNN variance thing, this was just an aside. There's a nice paper that uh, does architecture search over RNNs. But, yeah, one question? Okay, one thing for two before questions. Somebody forgot to write their name on the business. So, if you gave the quiz to me, I decided to room. I don't worry about that. Please pick up.